Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Isaiah, and of course you could guess that that has quite a lot of information about Isaiah himself. This is lesson number seven in that series for February 13 of 2021, and it will primarily focus on the chapters of Isaiah 36 to 39. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we turn now to your record to the, that you inspired Isaiah to write down. May we understand something of the ancient history and something of the implications of what was happening at that time and how it might affect us even today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you ever have the privilege of visiting the British Museum in London, you need to go to the room where the bas-relief pictures are from the palace at Nineveh. And there you will see, if you look very, there's a lot of things to see. It would, you could spend a long time looking at all the different things there, but I'm gonna describe something of what, we're gonna describe something of what you can see. Jim? A gaunt man walks barefoot with his two sons. Another family has loaded all their belongings onto an ox cart pulled by an emaciated oxen. A man leads the oxen while two women sit in the cart, skit on the cart. Less fortunate people have no cart, so they carry their positions on their shoulders. Soldiers are everywhere. A battering ram smashes into the city gate. Archers on top of the ram shoot at defenders on the wall. Hectic carnage reigns supreme. Fast forward. A king, a king sits grandly on his throne receiving booty and captives. Some captives approach him with hands upraised, pleading for mercy. Others kneel or crouch. Descriptions of the scenes with the king begin with these words, Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, and continue with such expressions as sat in a Nemedu throne. Uh, throne. And the booty of the city Lachish passed in review before him. That's John Malcolm Russell, the writing on the wall from Winona Lake. This is a, okay. And a, it's a Bible study guide is where it's quoted from our, in our bad Bible study guide. The kings of Assyria, who styled themselves as emperors, had no shortage of pride. They were great at bragging about their accomplishments. But one day, something happened, and you need to get the whole story here, so we're just going to beginning, we're just starting the story now. Something happened which was not according to their plan, and look at Isaiah 36, 1 to get the start of it. I'm reading for verse, from verse 1. In the 14th year that Hezekiah was king of Judah, Sennacherib, the emperor of Assyria, attacked the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. And that's from the American Bible Society. Yeah. The historical background tells us that when Sargon II died and Sennacherib became the new emperor, it looked like Assyria was temporarily weakened. Hezekiah, along with a group of other smaller nations, decided it was time to rebel against Assyria. The result was that Assyria attacked Judah and conquered and decimated all of Judah except Jerusalem. The pictures that you can see in the British Museum tell of his conquest of Lachish, about 30 miles from Jerusalem. You can see some of them on Google images to do with Lachish. Very good. Well, as we discussed in our last lesson, Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, had tried to purchase peace from the Assyrians by sending them gold and silver from Solomon's temple. Second Chronicles 28, 16 to 21. The Edomites, that's from Esau. Yes, descendants of Esau. Descendants of Esau began to raid Judah again and captured many prisoners. So King Ahaz asked Tiglath Pilsar, the emperor of Assyria, to send help. At this time, same time, the Philistines were raiding the towns of western foothills in the southern in southern Judah. So the picture here is he's he's getting attacked from both sides and also 
worried about the attack from the north. I mean, this was just impossible. <laughs> they captured the cities of Beth Shemesh, Aijolon, Ahilon, and Gederoth, and the cities of Soko, Timna, and Ginzo in their villages and settled there permanently. Huh. Because King Ahaz of Judah had violated the rights of his people and had defied the Lord, the Lord brought troubles on Judah. The Assyrian emperor, instead of helping Ahaz, opposed him and caused him trouble. So Ahaz took the gold from the temple and palace and the homes of the leaders of the people and gave it to the emperor, but even this did not help. Yeah, wow. Considering what we know about this story, was it a good idea for Hezekiah to rebel against Assyria? Not really. I don't think so. No. We know what happened to Israel when they were captured by the Assyrians. They disappeared. And that, we're talking about Israel here as the, as the northern kingdom of Israel. They were just scattered into, and we, we, we don't hear, we never hear from them again. But quickly, I mean, Hezekiah was, a, was one of the four God-fearing kings. Yes. The other four of Judah and the other four were kind of wishy-washy. Very. Mean, and during his time, two prophets were in business? Yes. Major, yeah. major prophets. Yes. And how could he do this? Well... <laughs> Right. I mean, he, he thought it was the right thing to do, apparently. Uh, clearly, it wasn't. But then again, the option, the option was to, to pay a lot of tribute and maybe to just recognize Assyria's lordship and, 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 let, and pay big taxes to them. I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, the daily sacrifice was still going on in the temple, you yes. want to think? The Urim and... Well, if, if you look at the story carefully, it had been stopped by Ahaz completely. He stopped the whole thing. Hezekiah reinstituted the daily sacrifice. So they were supposed to even, uh, the high priest, Urim and Thummim. Yeah. So all this... Why didn't they ask? Why didn't they ask? Yeah, exactly. I mean, why didn't they, why didn't they ask the uh, Isaiah? Says, exactly. Isaiah, what do you think? I mean, what would we do in our day? Yeah. What w well, <laughs> and I always wonder, what would we do in our day if someone had a Urim and a Thummim? Yeah, really. <laughs> really. We would say, we don't want to do what the Lord says. <laughs> well, when we, and we know what happened to the Assyrian army. Do you think God was responsible for Hezekiah's rebellion? So thousands, maybe millions of people died as a result of that rebellion. Yeah. We do know something about Hezekiah's attempt to prepare for the Syrian onslaught. Jim? 2 Chronicles 32, verses 1 to 8. After these events, in which Hezekiah, King Hezekiah served the Lord faithfully, Sennacherib, the emperor of Assyria, invaded Judah. He besieged the fortified cities and gave orders for his army to break their way through the walls. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib intended to attack Jerusalem also, he and his officials decided to cut off the supply of water outside the city in order to prevent the Assyrians from having any water when they got near Jerusalem. The officials led a large number of people out and stopped up all the springs so that no more water flowed out of them. The king strengthened the city's defenses by repairing the wall Building the tower on, tow, building towers on it, and building an outer wall. In addition, he repaired the defenses built on the land that was filled on the east side of the old part of Jerusalem. He also had a large number of spears and shields made. He placed all of the men in the city under the command of army officers and ordered them to assemble in the open square at the city gate. He said to them, "Be determined and confident." And don't be afraid of the Assyrian emperor or any of the army he is leading. We have more power on our side than he has on his. He has human power, but we have the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. The people were encouraged by these words of their, of their king. The Good News Bible. Well, we do not know or have evidence about most of the preparations he made. He, 
sounds like, I don't know how long it took him to do all this, but he, there was quite a bit of work done there. Yeah. Right. Um, we do have the Siloam water tunnel carved through the solid rock to bring water into the city limits of Jerusalem. And I would say if you ever have the opportunity to visit Jerusalem, you must go down and walk through the Siloam tunnel. Walk through. Walk through. Yeah. Wow. It is amazing. And if you look at, if we had time, I would show you pictures of they now, we now have pictures. So these two, t two teams started, one from the bottom end, one from the top end, and digging through the rock, solid rock like this, like it's, it's what, half a mile or something like this. They're digging, 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 digging like this. And they finally got the place where, and they, I mean, this was in the days when they had nothing but just, you know, you they, they thought they could hear somebody else hacking on the, the rocks over there. And, they, and so you see, they went sort of like this and, they, they, they came to each other. Yes. And, you, and you remember all of that, they, had to, they have to get on a nice continuous That's slope right. so the water would, right. would run downhill. Right, right. Amazing. Fourth of an inch. And then, and then when they finished, right in the middle there, middle of that tunnel, in a, in a thing about that size, they wrote a, a message in Old Hebrew uh, about what, how we did it and so forth and so forth there. Still there. And that, well, I wish it was still there. Uh, that thing was, when, when the modern archaeologists discovered that, they realized that this, the, 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 what is left of ancient Hebrew, is pieces of ancient Hebrew are really rare. They literally carved it out of the rock. And you can now see it in the archaeological museum in Istanbul. Because in those days, uh, it was Israel, Palestine was under, was under the Turkish rule. And so uh, it's there. You can go to the archaeological museum in Istanbul, and there's the original rock. It's been beat up quite a lot and so forth, the original piece of rock. Now, is that where the Gihon Spring came from? No. Yes, the Gihon, the Gihon Spring is, the whole city is on sort of a slant down like this. And the Gihon Spring is up here, but it's outside the city. But it's down below t the top of what is now called Temple Mount, is it, isn't it? Yeah, below, okay. below Temple Mount, and, yeah. And so this it's down here, so what happened is they built, they carved through the rock, however long it took like this, and clear, so the walls of the city went down over the edge like this, so that when they built their tunnel, it came out to a pool, which is clear down in the corner here, was actually lower than the spring up here. So they closed off the top of the spring, and down like this, and so now, the, the, the Pool of Siloam, which was, of course, famous in the New Testament, was, um, with a place where the water came out, and so everybody in Jerusalem had to go down there to, to get their water. But that's all below what is traditionally called Simple yes. Mount today. Yes. Where, and that's where the temples apparently were, according to this Ernest L. Martin. They ignore what Je Josephus had told them, is that it was down there where, where all these, these springs were. Because all they have on what is pr traditionally now called Temple Mount is uh, uh, was, cisterns up there. Yeah. But the, the water is from the springs down below. Yeah. Yeah. So this was done by Hezekiah, you say? This was done by Hezekiah, ordered by Hezekiah, as part of these preparations. And it's still there. Yeah, yeah you can, you can, you can, get, I mean, you have to pay, I think, well, it's a small amount, but you pay for somebody to guide you through. I mean, not like you get lost, but, yeah. <laughs> you know. One way in and one way out. Well, what the thing about it is that once in a while, some a blockage will get down at the other end if you don't know about it. And boy, that tunnel fills up pretty fast, and you could yeah. just about drown yourself. You know, really, when you're in a tunnel, you really don't know which way you're going. And for them, in those days, half yep. a mile apart to yeah. come face to face, uh, it amazing. really, truly, truly is amazing. It you know, is. When they were digging the English Channel, the under the English Channel, they have a tunnel. A channel. Right. Channel. And they were, wow, yeah, we made it, but with all the technology, and come to think, these guys yes. had nothing. Yes. yes, exactly. Well, there, and I had the privilege going there and taking pictures of it myself, mm -hmm. of that piece of stone that they, and I've walked through the tunnel. But Hezekiah did not limit his preparations to military, military reinforcements and human plans. Gary, I think, is that yours? I'll take it. But the king of Judah had determined to do his part in preparing to resist the enemy. And having accomplished all that human ingenuity and energy could do, he had assembled his forces and had exhorted them to be of good courage. 
That's from Prophets and Kings, page 351, paragraph 2. So was it, was it a waste of time for Hezekiah to go through all those preparations when he could have just relied on the Lord, on God? <laughs> One wonders. Yeah, well, notice these comments in the New Testament, which are sort of on the same subject. Charles? Yeah, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, dear friends, this is St. Paul speaking, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, as you always and obeyed just me, a comment there. Philippians was written just before Paul was released from prison in Rome the first time. Remember, he was, he, he was taken to Rome. He was brought through this whole process like this. He appeared before Caesar and Nero. In fact, um, incredible as it might seem, he, he was released. And he went out, and he, he was a free for another about a year or two, and then he was rearrested and came back the next time he was beheaded. So this was, Philippians was written just at the end of that first, first imprisonment. imprisonment. Yeah, so then, dear friends, as you always obeyed me when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey me now while I am away from you. Keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation. I think in King James, work out your own salvation mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. Yeah. Because God is always at, you, at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. Yes. Well, Sennacherib had a powerful military. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But he realized that if he could overcome an enemy by psychology, it was a lot better than having to fight for it. I mean, you know, if you, they just surrender... You don't, you don't have to risk your men, you don't have to use your military force, you don't have to waste your time. Sennacherib himself was busy trying to conquer Lachish, or Lachish, as they would say. So he sent a trusted palace official known as the Rabshaka. And that's described in 2 Kings 18, 17. Which literally means the chief cupbearer. So apparently, this guy was... A cup, he wasn't just a cupbearer, he must have been a powerful confidant, probably spoke multiple languages, and maybe it translated for the king, who knows. Well, he was the chief cupbearer. Yeah. He had yeah. to be trusted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So he sent him to go to Jerusalem to see if he could get them to surrender. What happened in that encounter is key to our whole understanding of this story. Notice the details. And Charles, I think you and I are going to split that one. Okay. Isaiah 36, uh, 2 to 22. Mm -hmm. Then he ordered his chief official to go from Lachish to Jerusalem with a large military force to demand that King Hezekiah should surrender. Let me just interrupt there for a second. So Lachish and Jerusalem were the only two cities still left not conquered. Lachish is the next most important city. And so he's down there sieging Lachish and trying to conquer it. And he says, go up there and see if, if we can convince those people in Jerusalem just to give up. The official occupied the road where the clothes worker workers were, work by the ditch that brings water from the upper pond. We talked about it earlier. Mm. Three Judeans came out to meet him. The official in charge of the palace, Eliakim, son of Hikeah, the court secretary, um, Shebna, and the official in charge of the records, Joah, jo the son of Aspa. The Assyrian official told them that the emperor wanted to know what made the king, what made King Hezekiah so confident. He demanded, do you think that the words can take the place of the military skill and might? Who do you think you helped? rebel against Assyria? You are expecting Egypt to help you? But that would be like using a reed as walking stick. It would break the jab of your hand. That is what the king of Egypt is like when anyone relies on, on him. Was he speaking the truth? Maybe yes. he was. Yeah. Uh, the Assyrian official went on, or will you tell me that you are relying on the Lord, your God? It was the Lord's shrines and temples that Hezekiah destroyed. Well, 
It was not the Lord's, but Hezekiah did. Okay, so here's, here's what we, we need to get this part of the story very clear because this is really essential. Remember that Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, had, you know, yep. put all these pagan yep. fertility cult things, so forth like this. And Hezekiah, Hezekiah came along. He said, no, we're getting rid of all those things. So now the, the, uh, this guy, he knows about that story. He knows the fact that God had done that, or that, that Hezekiah had done that. So now he's, he wants the people to believe that, okay, these are your real gods. Hezekiah has already destroyed the places for you to worship your real gods. How can you, how can you trust in him to, to do anything when, he, when Hezekiah has already destroyed his, all his temples and all the places for you to worship him? Of course, we know that that wasn't the story, but he was, that's, what he, that's the picture he's trying to paint here. And perhaps playing psychology yeah. and putting fear in the minds of the people yep. who are listening to this. Um, and Jerusalem to worship at one altar only. He told the people of Judah and Jerusalem to worship at one altar only. I'll make a bargain with you. In the name of the emperor, I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find people to ride them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's a big insult, isn't it? Yes. Um, you are to match. No or, match. You are no match for even the lowest ranking Assyrian official. And yet you expect the Egyptians to send you chariots and cavalry? Do you think I have attacked your country and destroyed it without the Lord's help? The Lord himself told me to attack it and destroy it. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to interrupt here. Yes. You notice that those two words there, Lord, Lord, are in all caps. Right. What does that mean? Yahweh. He's using the personal name of God. He's insulting God himself. And he, he wants these people to know that, you know, that this is, this is very serious, that he knows all about their religion and, and that all their altars have been destroyed, etc. Or is, it, is he still playing psychology or is he doing both? Well, he's doing, he's playing psychology, yeah, he's doing all that. He knows this stuff. And he also knows that they're very weak. Yeah. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the official, Speak Aramaic to us. That's, of course, the language of Nineveh. We understand it. Don't speak Hebrew. All the people on the wall are listening. Now you, now you see he's really using psychology. He replied, Do you think you and the king are the only ones I, the emperor sent me to say all these things to? No, I am also talking to the people who are sitting on the wall, who will have to eat their own excrement and drink their, their urine just as you will. Mm. Wow. Then the official stood up and shouted in Hebrew, Listen to what the emperor of Assyria is telling you. He warns you not to let Hezekiah deceive you. Hezekiah can't save you. And don't let him persuade you to rely on Yahweh, the Lord. Don't think that Yahweh will save you and that he will stop our Assyrian army from capturing your city. Don't listen to Hezekiah. The emperor of Assyria commands you to come out of the city and surrender. You will all be allowed to eat grapes, from your own vines and figs from your own trees and to drink water from your own wells until the emperor resettles you in a country much like your own where there are vineyards to give wine and there is corn for making bread. Don't let Hezekiah fool you into thinking that the Lord, Yahweh, will rescue you. Did the gods of any other nation save their countries from the emperor of Assyria? Where are they now? The gods of Hamath and Arpad. Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Did anyone uh, save Samaria? When did all, any of the gods of all these countries ever save their country from our emperor? Then what makes you think Yahweh, the Lord, can save Jerusalem? The people kept quiet, just as King Hezekiah had told them to, and they did not say a word. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah tore their clothes in grief and went and reported to the king what the Assyrian official had said. Good news Bible. Mm. Wow. Well, uh, we, we need to be honest. A lot of what the guy said was true. Yes. His words made powerful arguments. Egypt could not be trusted. The nations around had been conquered, and Hezekiah himself had torn down the high places and altars throughout Judah. 
what was happening in those high places and before those altars? Were those only fertility cult worship sites? Or is it possible that some of the children of Israel were actually offering sacrifices to Yahweh at those sites? We don't know. It could be. But that was not the command. No. God told them only to worship, only to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem, at the temple in Jerusalem. Well, then we go back to um, um, uh, Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same yeah. problem playing out here. And then finally, the official said, I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many riders. Wow. Ancient cities were very prone to having sieges. In the days when there was no gunpowder or any airplanes, a high wall, thick and strong, was a good defense. I mean, what can you do? You can throw a stone over. You can shoot an arrow if somebody's up on the top. But, it, but you know, you can't shoot an arrow and hope over a wall. I mean, you could shoot an arrow over the wall, but you have no idea where your arrow is going to. So... And you can't climb up the wall because there's people up on top who are going to be throwing things down from you and, and so forth. So these big old walls are pretty, pretty safe places. I mean, there were, there were cities who survived for years under siege. I mean, Jerusalem itself survived three and a half years on one siege. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. in 40, right? 80, 40? Something like that, yeah. Ancient cities were very prone to having sieges in the days when there was so forth. But how long can people survive inside a walled city which is under siege? The people of Jerusalem must have known that essentially the entire nation of Judah had already been captured. Many of the people from those cities and villages had probably escaped and rushed into Jerusalem hoping to be safe there. Furthermore, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been conquered about 20 years earlier. Samaria had fallen after a long siege by Assyria. You can read about that in 2 Kings 18, 9, and 10. It did not look like Jerusalem had much of a chance of surviving. Some years earlier, Isaiah had been given a vision about the emperor of Syria as the instrument of God. Isaiah himself had been given this vision. And what did he, what did he learn, Jim? Isaiah... Chapter 10, verses 5 to 11. The Lord said, Assyria, I use Assyria like a club to punish those who, with whom I am angry. I sent Assyria to attack a godless nation, people who have made me angry. I sent them to boot, loot and steal and trample on the people like dirt in the streets. But the Assyrian emperor has his own violent plans to, in mind. He is determined to destroy many nations he boasts, every one of my commanders is a king. I conquered the cities of Kino and Carchemish, the city of Hamath and Arpad. I conquered Samaria and Damascus. I stretched out my hand to punish th those kingdoms that were worship idols, idols more numerous than those of Jerusalem and Samaria. I have destroyed Samaria and all its idols and I will do the same in, to Jerusalem and the images that are worshipped there. Good news, Bible. Wow. Well, with these words ringing in his ears, it was it difficult for Isaiah to respond to Hezekiah's request? He knew perfectly well that God had been using the Assyrians. But would God protect Jerusalem? There are times when God's people are faced with situations like that. Have you ever faced such a situation? Ask you out there. Do these situations give us the opportunities to grow our faith? We know what happened. The oratory of the Assyrian chief officer had its impact on Hezekiah and his officials. Kerry? I'm reading 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 37 through 19. Uh, then Eliakim, Shebner, and Joah tore their clothes in grief and went and reported to the king what the Assyrian official had said. As soon as King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes in grief, put on sackcloth, and went to the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the official in charge of the palace, Shebna, the court secretary, and the senior priest to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They also were wearing sackcloth. 
This is the message which he told them to give Isaiah. Today is a day of suffering. We are being punished and are in disgrace. We are like a woman who is ready to give birth but is too weak to do it. The Assyrian emperor has sent his chief official to insult the living God. May the Lord your God hear these insults and punish those who spoke them. So pray to God for those of our people who survive. And that's from the Good News Bible. Wow. This was a life and death situation. Hezekiah and all of his associates understood that they could die. Fortunately for them, Hezekiah, speaking on behalf of all those in Jerusalem, turned to God. And how did God respond? Isaiah 37, 5 through 7. When Isaiah received the king Hezekiah's message, he sent back this answer. The Lord tells you not to let the Assyrians frighten you by their claims that he cannot save you. The Lord will cause the emperor to hear a rumor that will make him go back to his own country and the Lord will have him killed there. Good news, wow. Bible. Well, it was a short message from Isaiah, but it gave hope to Hezekiah and his Isaiah and some of their close associates. Sennacherib and his chief cupbearer must have been frustrated because their clever oratory had not gotten them the victory in Jerusalem. Well, he realized that the only hope that Hezekiah had left was trusting in the Lord. We do not know exactly how much Sennacherib understood about the God of Hezekiah and Isaiah, but he resp responded by saying, Isaiah 37, 10 and 12, Do not let your God on whom you rely deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Have the gods of the nations delivered them. That's from the New Revised Standard Version. Hezekiah did not hesitate, despite that brief response, to go to the temple and pray urgently. Now, I, I wonder, okay, he went to the temple, and we know what the temple, how it was laid out. Did he go into the courtyard? Was he allowed to do that? He certainly couldn't have gone into the holy place or the most holy place. So probably just into the courtyard or maybe just at the gate of the courtyard. The sinners did go into the courtyard, I thought. Well, a little ways in, yeah. Yeah, a little ways yeah. uh, up to the... Burnt offering place, yeah. I think. They stood there. So. Yeah. And that was still considered a temple, mm -hmm. part of the temple. Yeah. Jim? Isaiah 37, 15 to 20. I prayed, Almighty Lord, God of Israel, enthroned above the winged creatures, you alone are God, ruling all the kingdoms of the world. You created the earth and the sky. Now, Lord, hear us and look at what is happening to us. Listen to all the things that Sennacherib is saying to insult you, the living God. We all know, Lord, that the emperor of Assyria, that the emperors of Assyria have destroyed many nations, made their lands desolate, and burnt up their gods, which were no gods at, at all, only images of wood and stone made by human hands. Now, Lord our God, Rescue us from the Assyrians so that all our nations of the world will know that you alone are God. You know, that's that, a pretty that's, powerful argument. It, it is, but it's the, it is, doesn't relate to the, what we call the Lord's Prayer, does it? No. They're, they're asking for, they haven't been doing what's right, mm -hmm. and then they ask uh, to, to fight their battles for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus says, you know. Yeah. Okay, when Sennacherib did not, what Sennacherib did not realize, but hopefully Hezekiah did, although perhaps not as much as he should have, was that when one challenges God in open speech, God feels that it is necessary to respond, and respond he did. We must not forget that. Kerry? According to Sennacherib, as reported in his annals, he took 46 fortified towns, besieged Jerusalem, and made Hezekiah the Jew, quote, a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence like a bird in a cage, unquote. Uh, that comes from James Pritchard, editor, ancient Near Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament. But in spite of his penchant for propaganda as an extension of his mon monumental ego, Neither in text nor in pictures does he claim to have taken Jerusalem. 
From a human point of view, this omission is amazing given the inexorable power of Sennacherib and the fact that Hezekiah led a revolt, a revolt rather, against him. Rebels against Assyria had short life expectancies <laughs> and gruesome death. And that's from the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. For I, have that, um, I have that ancient area in Texas, it's a big old book at home, and it's, you know, lots and lots of words you have to, but every once in a while there's something like this that just, boom, sort of hits you between the eyes. It's really potent stuff. Um, hmm. Biblical scholars and archaeologists have to, had to admit, or have to admit, even now, have to admit that even without the biblical record, some kind of a miracle must have taken place. For that enormous army to all of a sudden disappear, and there is no hint of Jerusalem being conquered, something incredible happened. But Bible students know what happened. Charles? Isaiah 37, 21 through 37. Then Isaiah sent a message telling King Hezekiah that in answer to the king's prayer, the Lord had said, the city of Jerusalem laps at you, Sennacherib, and despises you. Whom do you think you have been insulting and ridiculing? You have been disrespectful to me, the holy God of Israel. You sent your servants to boast to me that all your chariots you had conquered and highest mountains of Lebanon. You boasted that there you cut down the tallest cedars and finest cypress trees and you reached the deepest parts of the forest. You boasted that you dug wells and drank water in the foreign lands, and that the feet of your soldiers trampled the, the Nile River dry. Wow. Have you never heard that I planned all this long ago? And now I have carried it out. I gave you the power to turn fortified cities into piles of rubble. The people who lived there were powerless. They were frightened and stunned. They were like grass of a field of weeds growing on a roof when the hot east wind blasts them. Yeah, well, but I knew and looking at it, but I knew everywhere, everything about you, what you do and where you go. I mean, what's, what's God saying here? I know everything. I, yeah, yeah, I know all about your boasting. Yeah. I know about all your claims, all that kind of stuff. I know you're, you're how you rage against me. I have received the report of that rage and that pride of yours, and now I will put a hook through your nose and a bit in your mouth and will take you back by the road on which you came. I wonder if this message got back to him. <laughs> he, would have, he would have been very upset by it, I'm sure. Then Isaiah said to King Hezekiah, this is a sign of what will happen. This year and next you will have only wild grain to eat, but the following year you will be able to sow your corn and harvest it. And this is... This is the British version of things, so corn there really means wheat. And plant vines and eat grapes. Those in Judah who survive will flourish like plants that send roots deep into the ground and produce fruit. There will be people in Jerusalem and on Mount Zion who will survive because Yahweh the Lord Almighty is determined to make this happen. This is what the Lord has, uh, this is what the Lord has said about the Assyrian emperor. He will not enter the city or shoot a single arrow against it. No soldiers with shields will come near the city and no siege mounds will be built round it. He will go back by the road on which he came without entering this city. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will defend this city and protect it for the sake of my own honor and because of the promise I made to my servant David. Now, before I finish up here, does that passage, those, that statement remind you of anything? I will defend this city and protect it for the sake of my own honor. Oh, yes. Where else, who else said something like that? Was that Moses? Well, no, Mo it was, no it wasn't it was Moses. Jerusalem during his time. Daniel said something oh, like yeah. that, and Ezekiel said it many times, many times. Of course, they, they were coming later. This was, this was before their day. But they, many times they said that. So God, so God is doing what? He has to act now for his own name's sake. He cannot allow his people to be just completely, you know, decimated 
And, that, and, and because if he, if he allowed that to happen, what would all the nations say? This, this kind of, that was kind of like uh, Moses had said, you know, yeah. if, we do, if we don't do something. So it's been said many times yes, down, down exactly. through history. Yeah, Moses said to God, he said, you know, if you, le if you let your people be destroyed out here, what will people say? That's, that's yeah, so that's what you were... This, but this is a case where God is actually saying it. So, an angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay all dead. Then the Assyrian emperors, Emperor Sennacherib withdrew and returned to Nineveh. And he was killed when he went back. Yeah, he was killed by his sons. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he killed by his two oldest sons who then escaped, and his youngest son became the next ruler. But he, they, and they never had the strength after this. Before we go, uh, there's the place uh, where it says a uh, child is about to be born, but we have no strength to deliver. Yeah. That was somewhere here that uh, yes. we went through, right? Yes. Yeah. Back a little ways. Who, who was that? It was not Isaiah who said that, but someone. If we don't have the time, I'll just go back. Yeah, no, I, 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 that was that was said by Isaiah to... Uh, that was said by Isaiah. I believe so. To Hezekiah, was it? I think so. Somewhere it's back yeah, here well, a little bit. Further, yeah. It just stayed with me somewhat, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'll go through it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, God's reputation must be upheld at all costs. And that's really what the theme of the great controversy, isn't it? God, you know, God is the, is the, the only God of the universe. He's in, he's in charge. He rules. He rules in love. That's the nature of his government is love. But uh, in order for him to do that, he has to, be, he, he, he has to demonstrate that he's in charge. This proud Assyrian emperor thought that his pagan gods were more powerful than the God of Hezekiah. But on this occasion, he made a terrible mistake. God reassured Isaiah, Isaiah and Hezekiah. What happened is detailed in 2 Kings 19, 35 and 36, and Isaiah 37, 33 to 39 make it very clear. And it's interesting that this story is so important to Hebrew history that it's repeated verbatim in those two places. They're word for word. Now, is that plagiarism? <laughs> we should note in passing I should say that uh, it's almost certain that Isaiah wrote the original story and that 2nd Kings was later uh, he picked up the story it was probably done by, by Jeremiah that was what 150 years later or something we should note in passing that some scholars say that it is impossible for any ancient nation to have had an army as large as 185,000 but we need to remember that Nineveh controlled a lot of territory by that time. And war was their theme. Their god was a god of war. They worshipped the god of war. And if anyone wanted to be somebody in Nineveh, he had to have stories of conquest. So what happens under those circumstances? Everybody goes out to war. But when God takes action, the results are absolute and unequivocal. Jim? The God of the Hebrews had prevailed over the proud Assyrian. The honor of Jehovah was vindicated in the eyes of the surrounding nations. In Jerusalem, the hearts of the people were filled with holy joy. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 361. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. All those nations around that had already been conquered by Assyria and their people had been scattered, what do you think they said when they heard about this story? Got their attention, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and did they think there was something different between the God of the Hebrews and their pagan gods they had been worshipping? There's a good chance, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Kind of like the story with Jericho and Nate Rahab. Yeah. You know, the word get, gets around fast, yeah. you know. I just recently heard a story about uh, the, the boy who, who, who comes home and he's talking to his mom about the, wall, the walls of Jericho fell down. And the mom said to him, it's all, it's all right, Sonny, don't, don't worry. We, we won't punish you for that. So, the, uh, no, it was somebody else 
told the boy that this and the story of the boy doing and then he goes to the father and he says what are you going to do about this the walls of jericho fell down your boy was talking about it and the, and the father says don't worry we'll pay for them to be rebuilt <laughs> <laughs> The thing that caught my attention here a little while ago, you don't hear a lot in the Bible, at least I haven't seen it, about horses, and he offered 2,000 horses. Yeah. The very fact that they had those and what keeps the horses alive, etc., they could have had 185,000 troops. Yeah. <clears throat> it's important to note in passing that the northern kingdom of Israel had already been scattered to the winds by Assyria and had been lost to history. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. The Zionists try to claim that, that these ten tribes ended up in England and so forth and you know, that kind of nonsense. Only the southern kingdom of Judah was left. If Jerusalem had been conquered and its inhabitants were scattered throughout the territory of Assyria, who would have been left to give birth to the Messiah? Yeah. So this is not just a, well, that's an interesting story, move on. This is, this is key to the whole plan of salvation as we understand it. So yeah, actually, as we read also the history, scattering happened after the death of Jesus, after he left this world. They were scattered. Oh, oh I mean the know. Jews later. The Jews were scattered. Yeah, they were also scattered, yeah. Right, right. But yeah, yeah very good point here, because if they were scattered, oh, where would the Messiah come from? Yeah. In those days, literally millions of people died from those wars between different nations. Who knows how many of the people of Judah died as a result of Sennacherib's conquest of all Judah, but just all, Ju all Judah but Jerusalem. Then 185,000 of his soldiers died. I mean, you think about it, that's almost one-fifth of a million right there. Yeah. Right. Human life seemed to be of little value in those days. It is possible that Sennacherib actually made two campaigns against Judah, there's some evidence in that, for that in his records. But the biblical account seems to sum summarize them in a single account. And it's not, it's not like two counts far apart. It, one attack and he backs off a little bit and then he comes back a second time. So it really was one big campaign. Does the fact that the Bible three times records this story of this direct challenge of God by the Assyrian leaders as they approach Jerusalem, Isaiah 36 and 37, 2 Kings 18 and 19, and 2 Chronicles 32, it's recorded almost verbatim in three different places. Mean that this confrontation or face-off and God's response to this direct challenge was very important in the great controversy? Absolutely. Compare the records of the life, death, resurrection, and teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, which are often recounted in three or four different places. You would have thought with, you know, all the interesting stuff, well, you know, John said, if, if everything was written down that could have been written about down by life of Jesus, wouldn't, there wouldn't be enough space in the heavens to, or to, to, so, but yet we have three people recording almost verbatim the stories of, especially that final week in the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? This is absolutely crucial, critical information for you to know. I mean, the, 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 to the ancient Hebrews, they didn't have words like more and most. They didn't have uh, comparative and superlatives. So and to, to say more, you said it twice. And to say most, you said it two or three times. So this is their way of, of really emphasizing this is important, this is what happened. Unfortunately, this very humble trusting in God is not the only story we have of Hezekiah. Shortly after Sennacherib retreated home, it is recorded in Isaiah 38, 5 and 6, and 2 Kings 6, that Hezekiah came down with a fatal illness. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 38, verses 4 to 6. Then the Lord commanded Isaiah to go back to Hezekiah and say to him, I, the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will let you live 15 years longer. I will rescue you and this city of Jerusalem from the emperor of Assyria, and I will continue to protect the city. It's um, interesting to notice that uh, he, I will let you live 15 years longer. Yeah. When Hezekiah died, 
his son who took over was the worst king in the whole history of, of Israel, uh, Manasseh. How old was he when he became king? Just a boy. I think he was a kid. Twelve years old. So this extension of Hezekiah's life, he gave birth to that very wicked son. Okay, Charles, I think you're next. Second Kings uh, 20 verse 6. I'll let you live 15 years longer. I'll rescue you and the city of Jerusalem from the emperor of Assyria. I'll defend the city for the sake of my own honor. And because, Notice that again. Yes. I will do it for what? Not oh because God. you're good, not because you're serving me, but I need to do it for my own namesake. Yeah. And because of the promise I made to my servant, King David. David. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. No worries. Satan was determined to bring about both the death of Hezekiah and the fall of Jerusalem. Reasoning, no doubt, if Hezekiah um, were out of the way, his efforts at reform would cease and the fall of Jerusalem could be the more readily accomplished. Articles regarding, regarding Isaiah 38.6, SDA Bible Commentary. I don't know how often, how much you've thought about this, but if you go through the history of the Bible, there are a number of times when Satan was sure, okay, I got it. Got it. Mm. Yeah. And then God would do something remarkable and, oh no, sort of start over again. Yeah. So this was one of them. This was one of those times. If, 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 God, if, if Satan had been able to just get rid of Hezekiah and, and eliminate his reforms, he probably would have. I mean, look at Manasseh, yeah. how awful he was. What happened next is very interesting. Remember from our previous studies that Isaiah approached Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, and asked him to ask for a sign from God. Ahaz refused. But in this story, Hezekiah essentially said, here I am, about to die. Give me a sign that the Lord will bless me. So here's the son saying, I want a sign. So Hezekiah ended up asking for that sign in which the shadow of the sundial went back 10 degrees. The Babylonians, far away by the river Euphrates, had taken a very deep interest in astronomical phenomena. When the sun went back 10 degrees, they immediately noticed. They started asking why that happened. Babylon had tried to rebel against Assyria on many occasions and had failed, as we have noted in previous lessons. But now here's somebody who succeeds in his rebellion against Assyria, and now this happens. But when they heard, heard about Hezekiah's illness and his request for the sun to go back 10 degrees, they immediately sent emissaries to talk with him. Surely any person who had a connection with any god who was capable of turning the sun back 10 degrees as someone all would want to know. Mm. King Merodach Baladan was excited to learn more about Hezekiah. Yeah. God said, because they were, they were trying to rebel against Assyria also back in those days. God sent those emissaries from Babylon to Hezekiah, hoping that Hezekiah would continue to exhibit his faith in God and tell them about the great God who controls the heavens and the earth. But unfortunately, that is not what happened. Jim? Only by the direct interposition of God could the shadow on the sundial be made to turn back 10 degrees. And this was to be the sign to Hezekiah that the Lord had heard his prayer. Accordingly, the prophet cried unto, excuse me, the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards by which it by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Prophets and Kings, Prophets 342, and, yeah. Prophets. 342, paragraph 4. Yeah, so this was, this was a kind of a, of a sundial that they had, they had, and they thought, whoa, look at that thing's going backwards. The visit of these messengers from, the, I'm sorry, Carrie, that's yours. Okay, the visit of these messengers from the ruler of a faraway land gave Hezekiah an opportunity to extol the living God. How easy it would have been for him to tell him of God, the upholder of all created things, through whose favor his own life had been spared when all other hope had fled. So now think about Hezekiah. He'd done a lot of good things. 
he had been preserved but because of that yeah. victory over the Assyrians etc why didn't he carry on and, and, and speak the truth to the Babylonians and say look at I, all this has happened to me because of the God that I worship go ahead okay by pr but pride and vanity took possession of Hezekiah's heart and in self-exaltation he laid open to cover his eyes the treasures with which God had enriched his people. The king, quote, showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices, and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Isaiah 39, 2. Not to glorify God did he do this, but to exalt himself from the eyes of the foreign princes. And that's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 344. Hmm. Well, Seventh-day Adventists know that difficult times are ahead of us. No doubt Satan was responsible for the challenges that the, the Reb Shaka spoke against Hezekiah in Jerusalem. If that is the case, what does he say about us? Satan is an accuser of all God's faithful people. He would love to destroy us and get rid of us so that he could claim that this world as, claim this world as his unchallenged domain. And you can read about that. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Revelation 12, 7 to 12. How would you feel if you knew that the leader of your government or even your church received direct messages from God? Have you ever wondered about that? Hezekiah and Isaiah had been responsible for driving away the Assyrian army. Then they were responsible for that personal healing of Hezekiah by following the directions of God. In our day, are we inclined to trust in God when difficult times come? Is our faith, is our faith growing on a day-by-day -day basis as we walk more and more continually in God's path? Hezekiah had started out in a very good note. Second Chronicles 29, 1-5 Hezekiah became king of Judah at the age of 25, and he ruled in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother was Abijah and the daughter of Zechariah. Following the example of his ancestor, King David, he did what was pleasing to the Lord. And Jim, I'm going to have to interrupt there. He tore down all the temples and so forth. We're running out of time. He, he, all the evil stuff and all the stuff. And he had done a good job. He, Ezekiah knew what had happened to his northern neighbors, but he turned and depended most of the time on the Lord. Let's pray. Our kind and wonder, wonderful Father, we thank you so much for this privilege we have of talking about your work in the past and thinking of the way you worked through people so long ago. Help us to have the courage to stand firm and faithful for you in the future uh, through whatever trials and troubles may come upon us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.